Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I'm president of the club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome first our members in the audience and their guests, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, before introducing our head table, I would like to remind listeners of upcoming speakers. On Wednesday, April 19th, marine explorer Jean-Michel Cousteau will talk about the search for sustainability, which could be a political topic too, I suppose. On Thursday, April 20th, Carol Browner, uh, administrator of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, will speak on the subject of, quote, the earth is in your hands, responsibility and opportunity in the new generation of environmental protection. Quite a long title. And on Friday, April 21st, Fernando Henrique Cardoza, the president of Brazil, will talk about Brazil and the challenges of our times. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our speaker today, you'll find cards <coughs> excuse me, at your table. Please write your questions on the cards, pass them up, and I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called from your right. Carol Byrne, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Christine Walton, Bloomberg Business News. Robert Novak, columnist, North American Syndicate. David Broder, columnist, The Washington Post. Mary Lou Forbes, commentary editor, the Washington Times, Charles Lewis, Washington Bureau Chief, Hearst Newspapers. Skipping over our guest speaker, Mark Johnson, Media General News Service and Chairman of the National Press Club's Speakers Committee. John Fogarty, Kiplinger, California Letter, and the member of the Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Thank you, John. Catherine Lewis of the Dallas Morning News, James Brosnan of the Memphis Commercial Appeal, Amy Breyer of Copley News Service, Steve Thoma, Knight Ritter Newspapers. <laughs> Our guest today is a Washington outsider. who wants to get inside the White House. In that, he follows in the tradition of most recent presidents. Bill Clinton, for example, was a White House, a Washington outsider who made it to the White House. Trouble is, when Washington outsiders are elected, they tend to become Washington insiders, leaving room for the next outsider to run. Lamar Alexander promises to be different. If elected, he says he'll dismantle so much of the Washington bureaucracy that no outsider will want to come here. <laughs> Mr. Alexander, who served as governor of Tennessee for eight years, has a list of $200 billion worth of federal programs he wants to send back to the states. For openers, he'd abolish the Department of Education, the very department that he headed under President George Bush. He'd also end the federal role in welfare, job training, law enforcement, and Medicaid. Governor Alexander already is displaying presidential qualities. He's a millionaire, for example and he presents himself as a man of the people. He announced for the presidency wearing khaki pants, a red and black flannel shirt, and boots. 
the same costume he wore when he walked across Tennessee to win the governorship in 1978. Mr. Alexander also knows how to retreat. Before the Republican takeover in, in, of Congress in November, Mr. Alexander supported term limits. Now that his party is in control, he says he'll be satisfied if members of Congress spend at least half a year at home to remember the principles that made America great. And Mr. Alexander also plays the piano. On the 14th floor of the press club, sir, we have the piano that Harry Truman played for Lauren Bacall when he was president. If you make it to the White House, you're invited to come up and serenade us. Born in 1940, Governor Alexander graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Vanderbilt University in 1962. He received his law degree from New York University in 1965. Since then, he's worked on Capitol Hill and in the White House, and he's headed the University of Tennessee. He and his wife, Honey, also started a business in 1987 that now employs 1,200 people. They have four children. Now, Governor Alexander yearns for a change in tempo as well as scene. He wants to trade in his rousing campaign song, Alexander's Ragtime Band, for the more sedate Hail to the Chief. He joins a crowded field of Republican contenders. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present the Washington outsider who wants in, Lamar Alexander of Tennessee. Thank you, Bud. Ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the 14th floor is where the piano usually is when I arrive to make a speech. People are now seen moving it out of the back door every time I, I come in. Last summer, I took a drive across our country. I spent the night with people that mostly I hadn't met before, and I found myself asking them this question, which I'd like to ask you t today. Looking ahead 20 years, do you think your children and your grandchildren will have more opportunity growing up in this country than you have had? Last summer, when I asked that question, I found most Americans were afraid to say yes. We're losing our confidence about our future, specifically about our future to pass off to our children and our grandchildren a better life than we have had. And maybe more specifically than that, we're losing our confidence about our ability to affect that future. So what I'd like to do in a few minutes today is to talk with you about what we're losing, about what we need to do to recapture it, and a little bit about the choices that we have in the presidential elections of 1996. First on the choices. We're well enough now into a telecommunications age that we can actually tell it and feel it. It's turned our everyday lives upside down. And as a result of that, we're in the midst of a generational change in our leadership. Look at 1992. Here came Clinton. And right after that came national health care, national school board, taxes on achievement, Joyce Lynn Elders instead of Bill Bennett, reinvent America in Washington, D.C. And Americans took a look at that and said, holy smokes. How on earth did Bill Clinton ever end up with that agenda and as the role model at a time when what we're trying to do is teach our children the difference between right and wrong and back we went as soon as we could go in 1994 with a Republican Congress and an agenda that was more like growth and freedom and personal responsibility. And so 1996 is a chance to decide which way in the midst of this generational change of leadership will we go. We have a chance to define our country for the future. We have a chance to decide whether 1994 is a bump or a turnaround uh, in our direction as a country. And we Republicans will be making an argument 
that we might do well to remember is an argument that no one can remember making or hearing in recent memory. We will be trying to persuade at least half the country that we ought to have Republican government, a Republican president, and a Republican Congress. Now let me just say right up front which direction I think we ought to go and how we ought to go. I noticed from my vantage point in Nashville and other places outside Washington, D.C., that Newt Gingrich has been getting a little bit of a hard time here and, and in some other places. I gave him an A-plus for his contract last fall when not many people would. And I would give him an A-plus again for leadership today. I like a Republican leader who has a sense of purpose and knows where he wants to take the country. I think Newt Gingrich is acting more like the President of the United States than the President himself. And my greatest fear, my greatest fear, is not that the Republican House will go too far, but that the Republican Senate will be too timid. The greatest hope for a Clinton White House is a do-nothing Republican Senate. I can already hear some of the disturbing signs, reservations, doubt, the balanced budget amendment vote was an ominous sign to me. I hear more talk about austerity than I do about growth. Some of the senators, and to be fair, some of the House members want to fix welfare in Washington, D.C. the Republican way. Our greatest danger now that we've captured Washington is that Washington might capture us, which is one reason, I believe, that despite all of the talk we've been hearing, that and despite the fact they're good people, that none of the Washington candidates who are running for the presidency are likely next year to be nominated by our party. We've had 20 United States senators who've run for the presidency since 1976, and none of them have ever been elected. We've had three members of Congress who have been promoted directly to the presidency in our 200-year history. Americans seem to instinctively know there's a difference between being a chief legislator and a chief executive. And so what I will be trying to do over the next year is persuade Americans to do what seems to have historically come natural to them, which is to look outside the Congress for somebody to be the Republican nominee. For a country that needs a chief executive, how about someone who's been one? Of a governorship, a university president, a cabinet secretary, for a country interested in job growth, how about someone who's helped his state grow jobs and who's actually created a company himself with 1,200 employees? Uh, for a country that needs a balanced budget, how about somebody who's actually balanced a budget? I've balanced eight, which is more than all of the other Republican candidates put together have balanced. Or for somebody who you want to stand up to a special interest group, how about somebody who hasn't just talked about it, but who unfortunately had to take on the National Education Association for a year and a half and put in place the only statewide program to pay teachers more for teaching well. If we're going to define the next generation of political leadership, how about someone from that generation? And while anyone in this country, including Washington, D.C., could be the President of the United States, I think for our party at this stage in our history that our strongest nominee will be someone whose heart and soul and language and energy and experiences are mostly, mostly and deeply outside of Washington, D.C. I've been here twice. I've had the privilege of working for two presidents, one in the late 60s and one in the 90s, whom I respected. But I went home. That's the difference between me and some of the others. Now, I think that's one reason our campaign's going pretty well. We've raised more than $6 million, which if you'll stop and think about it, is pretty good for someone who's not chairman of a big committee, who's not permitted to move campaign funds from one account to another, who hasn't become very well known yet. It's more than twice as much as President Bush raised in the first quarter before he became President of the United States. I'm very proud of the fact that nearly 6,000 people from all across this country have stepped up and give $1,000, mostly since March the 6th, to say we would like for you to be the President of the United States. I've only run into a couple of problems. The first is this name recognition problem. And that's partly the fact that I'm not from Washington as well. 
but I've been greatly encouraged lately by the example of Cato Kalin. <laughs> I mean, who ever heard of him two weeks ago? And now there are fan clubs all over the city. And then I've run into one other problem, and this one I really hadn't expected. There I was, and a few people from here were there, in Maryville, Tennessee, about six weeks ago, announcing my candidacy. And, as your president said, I was dressed as I dressed when I walked across the, walked across the state to be the governor in 1978. The peso was dropping, and Russia was in turmoil, and Washington was zigging and zagging, and the national media, with all of its unerring accuracy, focused right in on the most compelling issue facing America, my red and black flannel shirt. It's become better known than I have around this country. The Washington Post even ran an article, even ran an article interviewing red and black experts of shirts around the country and found someone who said my red and black shirt wasn't fit even to wear to a possum skinny, <laughs> which had to be someone who'd never been to a possum skinny before. <laughs> and then Sam Donaldson and Michael Kinsley and all of, the, all of those who know best said that it wasn't appropriate. So, so what I've done is, is this. I bought a dozen more, and I sent one to Sam Donaldson, and I've sent one to Michael Kinsley, and one to Eleanor Clift and to the Capitol Gang, and I've told them that when I walked across the state wearing that shirt in 1978, I couldn't give it away to start with, but it kept going up in value, and we auctioned it off, and they might want to keep this one too because it might go up in value one more time before we were through. I thought about the trouble, or what I see as the trouble with our country, on that day six weeks ago when I announced my candidacy. This business of our losing our confidence in our future, and I, I was reminded of whether, where I gathered my own. I stood on the steps of that home where I grew up in Maryville, Tennessee. One newspaper referred to it when I was appointed education secretary. They said, Mr. Alexander grew up in a lower middle class family in the mountains of eastern Tennessee, which was all right with me, but not, I discovered, when I called home the next week, all right with my mother, who was literally reading Thessalonians to gather strength for how to deal with this slur on the family. And she said what your mother might have said. We never thought of ourselves that way. You had a library card from the day you were three. You had a music lesson from the day you were four. You had everything you needed that was important. Everything I needed that was important, including a grandfather down the street who had run away and become a railroad engineer and gotten back in time to instruct us all, aim for the top, there's more room there. Including neighbors as I walked through school who were so nosy, I thought, that I never could have gotten in trouble, even if there had been trouble to get into because they were so deeply involved in my life. The school, I walked by it six weeks ago. There the teachers taught me more than algebra and English, where our Pledge of Allegiance came from, what was important about our civilization, some more about right and wrong, how to show up on time. The church was across the street. It was always open. It seemed like we were always there. And then down the street was the courthouse, where I announced for president and where my father had taken me when I was 10 years old to meet our congressman because he thought that was important. I was taught to look up to him, to what he did, and to this country, and it was from there that I gathered my confidence in our future. All of us did, growing up in that little town. But I've lived long enough to know that not every American can imagine for themselves and their children that kind of confidence about our future. I've stood on the corner in East Los Angeles with children who've given me books of their poems entitled Farewell to the Morning. That is their view of their life. Some friends of our children who are in their 20s now say to me they don't believe there is an American dream anymore. And then there are all those people I saw last summer who would not answer yes to the question, do you believe your children and your grandchildren will have more opportunity growing up in this country than you have had? I think we know exactly what to do about it. And the important words to remember are growth and freedom and personal responsibility. I know that growth is the answer because I've seen it work. In my hometown, when the aluminum plant moved in, it turned us into just an, from just another Appalachian County into one with jobs. I saw it in my state. We were 48th in family incomes when I started in 1978 and embarrassed. We had a governor selling pardons for cash 
out of the state capital. We weren't prepared for the telecommunications age, and we were at the back of the line. And today, my successor, a Democrat, will proudly tell you and give him credit and lots of other people that for the last 10 years, family incomes in our state have grown more rapidly than any other state. And we've gone from never having made a car to being the third producer of automobiles. And we were at the bottom of David Birch's list of state of entrepreneurial hotspots, and now we're seventh. And in 1986, the National Geographic said on its cover, rising, shining Tennessee. I've seen growth work. And in my private life, as was mentioned earlier, we started after I left the governor's office a company, borrowed some money, put a little money into it, three or four others, including Captain Kangaroo, and started a company that helps big companies provide child care services to their employees. We've not taken money out, but it's created 1,200 jobs, and we hope to make money on it. But the important thing is we understand that that is the way almost every single one of our new jobs in America is created by growing, rapidly growing companies. I was a growth governor. I started off trying to recruit jobs, Saturn, Nissan, we did pretty well, and I learned very quickly it was the environment in which new jobs could grow that made a difference. So we changed the usury limit. We changed the banking laws. We built 100 miles of interstate highways with our own money. We reduced debt, reduced the number of employees, earned a AAA bond rating, kept taxes, fifth lowest in the country, and we got quickly to education. Better schools meant better jobs, which meant better universities, chairs of excellence, computers in the schools, summer programs for gifted children. It meant as well paying teachers more for teaching well. That not only meant better schools. When Saturn came and somebody said, why are you in Tennessee? The president of Saturn says, because they paid teachers more for teaching well. And that's the kind of environment in which we want to try to build cars that compete with the Japanese and the German cars. I was a growth governor and I would be a growth president. I would cut the capital gains tax in a minute because I know that it would create a Niagara Falls of new jobs in this country. And this is an example where the Senate has a chance to show that it is not timid. Every time somebody says capital gains on our side, somebody on the other side says tax break for the rich and we back up. We should not back up on that. I mean, people know that if we have 100 million people working in the private sector and 10% of us lose our jobs every year, that the steady stream of good new jobs is the only way we can keep our standard of living. And having started a company and help a state grow, I know you can't get the money to create a new job from yourself if you don't have it or from a bank who won't loan it. You have to go to somebody who's got it. And they won't give it because we put a 40% tax on giving it from the federal and the states. That makes no sense and it doesn't help our standard of living. That, the principles of a flat tax, a focus on education and on deregulation, those are some of the elements of a growth presidency. There are two other things that are important to me. One is freedom. And I mean specifically freedom to plan our own lives. Ronald Reagan talked about that in 1964 when he was a citizen, never had been elected to anything before. He said, freedom is our enemy, uh, freedom is our value, and our enemy is com communism abroad and big government at home. And looking, looking back, I guess we could say one down and one to go, because the evil empire, as he called it, has collapsed, spreading freedom around the world, and big government has become a sort of arrogant empire. I know that it must get tiring to people in Washington, D.C. to have people here and people from outside come complain about Washington. But I think it's a different complaint right now. What most of us feel is that there seems always to be a small group of people, with a lot of them here, who are constantly telling us that we don't know what to do, that we're too stupid to make decisions for ourselves, that somehow agriculture department bureaucrats can cook a better meal for a hungry child in Maryville, Tennessee than someone who works there and lives there and who knows the child. That is the way I feel. That is the way most people feel. And this is nothing new for me. Most of you haven't known me when I was governor, but the first thing I did was close the Washington office and it would suit me fine if there was so little to get here after an Alexander presidency that all the offices were closed. In 1981, I came here to ask President Reagan 
to end federal aid to elementary and secondary education, give us the money and the decisions. I used to say I spent more time in Japan than Washington, D.C., because it would help our state more, and I did, and it did. And when I was chairman of the National Governors Association, I said, we should stop acting like senators. We should stop trying to be more chief executives. And as chairman of the governors, my advice in 1986 was that Congress should balance the budget and go home. I haven't changed my opinion much about what ought to be done. I would take elementary and secondary education and move it all out of Washington. Put it in the hands of people closest to the children. Same with job training. Same with welfare. Same with Medicaid. Same with most law enforcement. And I still believe that a six-month citizen Congress is a good idea, even if it's a Republican Congress. It would give it courage to move in the right direction and to not be timid. I heard this everywhere I went on that drive last summer, and I don't have time to tell you all those stories today. But if you don't believe me about the feeling about the arrogance of Washington, D.C., go ask Father Jerry Hill in Dallas, who runs the homeless shelter. He won't even take a federal grant anymore. He says, why should I spend all day Friday filling out forms to justify what I did Monday through Thursday? He is outraged about the federal government paying $446 a month in Social Security benefits, disability benefits, to drug addicts. How can I help them, he said, when they have that kind of taxpayer support? And ask Reuben Greenberg, the police chief of Charleston, South Carolina, about his two-year fight with HUD. Give Jack Kemp credit for changing it. Two-year fight with HUD so we could kick out criminals who were selling crack and make poor people safe. And Henry Delaney and Savannah and all across this country. We need the freedom to plan our lives for ourselves. And then the last thing, personal responsibility. We Republicans have tried to talk about this. We did in the last presidential election, and we didn't do the best job of it. And sometimes we talk about it among ourselves and we get stuck on one issue or another issue and we stop. But these are the most important issues and we should learn to talk about. I thought about it six weeks ago when I announced. I realized walking through those streets in Maryville, Tennessee that I carried a pocket knife to school every single day. Now there is a law against that, a federal law. That law won't do any good at all. The reason we didn't even think of using those pocket knives on each other was not because of the government, but because of those families we came from, those nosy neighbors who were involved in our lives, the teachers who taught us more than algebra and English, the churches and the synagogues that were open. On the first day of my drive across the country last summer, I stopped in Henning, Tennessee, the home of my late old friend, Alex Haley. I was spending the night with his boyhood friend, Fred Montgomery, who's now the mayor of Henning, this town of about 1,200 north of Memphis. They had just had their first drive-by shooting in Memphis, and they were sitting there in the city hall talking about it. No one thought the federal crime bill would help. No one called the governor to come in. They were talking about what they could do, a curfew for their children, a community code of parent responsibility that every parent would be asked to sign, and perhaps a city ordinance that would make it the responsibility of every parent whose child damaged somebody else's property to pay for that property. I remembered a visit to that town a few months earlier with our son, Will. Fred Montgomery took me through the house where Alex Haley's grandfather had lived and told me how they had grown up. I remember how Alex used to say with a twinkle in his eye that his grandma rocking on that porch and telling those stories that eventually became the stories of roots could knock a lightning bug out of the sky at 14 feet with an accurate stream of tobacco juice in the evenings telling those stories. Fred Montgomery said when Alex's grandpa came in he sat here and we showed him some respect. I was there with my son, Will, who was then 14. When we sat and listened to those stories, we never said a word because children were to be seen and not heard. Our parents chose with whom we played. If a boy came by with trouble in his mind, Alex's mother might say, come on in, aren't you late going somewhere, then you better get on, and only then 
could we go back out and play? And he looked straight at Will and said, a boy your age and a girl your age would never be allowed to stay alone in a house after 9 p.m. It just wasn't done. And then he said one more thing. Another thing that happened at 9 p.m. in every family with which I was familiar in Henning, said Fred Montgomery, was that we joined hands and went down on our knees in prayer because we believed that somehow our prayers would rise up into the clouds and make tomorrow better than today. And he looked at my son and said, I know that must sound awfully old-fashioned to you, but it worked. I've thought many times that if Fred Montgomery and Alex Haley, 70 years ago, in real poverty, real racism, and real lack of educational opportunity, could see that tomorrow would be better than today, and could manage, even for themselves, could manage, imagine, the promise of American life, then surely we ought to be able to do that today. The promise of American life is this irrational belief in our unlimited future and that every single one of us has a chance to participate in that. The next President of the United States, the person we will be electing this next year, will sit in the White House on the first day of the year 2000 with the responsibility for leading us into the next century. The main purpose of that president must be to rebuild our confidence in the promise of American life. What that president must do in order to accomplish that purpose is to restore growth and freedom and personal responsibility. I would like to be that president. I believe that purpose is as great as this country itself. And if you believe that the arrogance of Washington, D.C. is the problem and the character of our people is the answer, then my invitation to you is come on along. Thank you very much. Now comes the hard part, the questions. Besides Tennessee, what states do you have to win in the primaries to have a chance for the, for the nomination? And corollary question, do you plan to campaign in all of the states or pick just those that are your core states? My focus is to have the, number one, have the clearest message about how to rebuild our confidence, number one. Uh, number two, to raise uh, $20 million in 1995, which is we're well on our way to do. Number three, Iowa and New Hampshire. And number four, to assemble the best financial and political team, and many people think we, we have that. I'm going to try to do the best I can in those first two states, and if I do, then uh, I ought to be able to be nominated. Obviously, I can't uh, organize in the same way in all of the states. That hope all the other candidates do that, but that wouldn't be the way I... I would plan to go about it with the, with the resources that I have or that I think anybody else uh, has. Well, does that mean if you run third in Iowa and New Hampshire, you'll drop out of it all? If I run third in Iowa, I will claim a great come from behind victory. <laughs> if I run second, I will claim it a little louder. And if I run first, uh, you should declare me the winner and call off the rest of the election. <laughs> Several questions on the same point. You've made a lot of money with very small investments and with very large help from your friends. Doesn't this represent the old style of politics that voters have grown to hate? Well, thank you for the uh, neutral question. <laughs> the, uh, the answer to that would be no, of course not. I mean, the old style politics is you come to Washington and spend your whole life here. What's different about me is of the last 25 years, I've spent about half my time in public life and about half my time outside public life. And while I've been outside public life, I've done what most Americans do, which is to try to earn a living and try to make some money. And I've been successful at it. I would think we would want a president uh, who would help, uh, who'd made more good investments than bad ones. 
I think it would be helpful to have a president who actually knew how jobs were created. I mean, President Clinton comes on television and says, I created four million jobs. He doesn't know how a job is created. How would he know? He's all, always worked for the government. I mean, it is true that in 1987, as I mentioned earlier, I and Captain Kangaroo and my wife and three others actually started a company. We have borrowed $100,000 and we put in a little bit of money of our own and we had an idea and we developed a business plan and we recruited investors and for eight years we worked hard at that. They've done more than I have. I've only been an investor, not permitted to be on the board while I was in government. We haven't taken any money out of that company. We hope someday to make a lot of money. But 1,200 new jobs have been created. In this country, that is the way that almost every single new job is created in America. And we're not going to have a standard of living in this country unless we have a president who understands what job growth is. If we have 100 million people working in the private sector, 20 million in government, and 10 percent of those losing their jobs every year, if we don't have that steady stream of entrepreneurial activity, we won't have the confidence in our future that is the reason I'm running for president. So I think that my background in private life, the fact that I've helped to start a business, and the fact that in the state of Tennessee when I was governor, uh, we did very well in creating an environmental opportunity for people, uh, is a plus, not a minus. And I think it's important for people who are interested in this question to know that I've been very careful while I've been out of office to never do business with the state government. Um, I've been careful to disclose everything I've done since 1978. I'm probably the only candidate who will release all of his tax returns and information since 1978. That might be a good thing for all the other candidates to do as well. I've never done any lobbying and I never represent a foreign government. So uh, unless you want candidates who have only lived in Washington all their lives and always worked for the government, um, you're going to have to, you're going to have to permit people like me who have been in public life and private life to, to do that and treat it as an advantage and, 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 not, an, and not a disadvantage. Uh, sir, recalling that you raised taxes when you were governor of Tennessee, will you here and now say that if you are elected president of the United States, you will not raise any taxes under any circumstances except war? Well, that's a, uh, the answer to the question is, I, yes, I won't raise taxes while I'm President of the United States. Um, and I don't expect to get any sermons from anybody from Washington about fiscal management, balanced budgets, and taxes. Um, after eight years in Tennessee, we had the following in our state. We had fewer employees. We had less debt. We had a AAA bond rating. We had eight balanced budgets. Uh, we had no personal income tax, and we had the fifth lowest taxes of any state in America. All of the senators running have all voted to raise federal taxes. If they just hired me 20 years ago to manage the federal fiscal account, we wouldn't even be having this issue uh, today. Uh, continuing, one questioner asked, which do you give priority to, tax reduction or a balanced budget? And secondly, should the income tax be replaced? If so, by what? Well, of course we should have a balanced budget. I mean, I had eight when I was governor. Um, I believe it's utter foolishness for the government in Washington to spend 600 million more dollars a day than it brings in. Utter foolishness to do that. And of course we should do it. But I don't think we should give the Congress or President an award for balancing the budget any more than you give a Boy Scout an award for telling the truth. It's what they're supposed to do. And if all I had done as governor of Tennessee was balance the budget eight years, we'd still be 48th in average family incomes. So I balanced the budget. And then I went on to create a growth economy. And that's what I would try to do as president. So I would balance the budget. I would vote for the modest tax cut that came out of the House. I would certainly vote for the capital gains tax cut in a minute because I believe that would increase revenues and jobs. And I would look forward to the time when we could move on to the second part of your question, move toward a different tax system that's a few pages, not thousands of pages long, that emphasizes simplicity, growth, uh, and investment. 
Those are the principles that ought to underlie our tax system. I'm against a national sales tax. The primary reason for that is because I believe in moving more responsibility to states and communities, and that is their principal source of taxation. That may be a little different reason than other people give for this, but I would not like to see the federal government arrogate the sales tax as its own tax. First, because it would undermine state and local strength at a time when it needs to go the other way, and second, because it's too easy to increase uh, for the federal government. I'm very interested in a flat tax with the principles that I just described. All right, just to be clear, so you say we can both cut taxes and balance the budget yeah, at the same time? Yeah, if you want me to do it again, I'll be glad to. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really ridiculous. I think that is just a ridiculous point to make. I mean, I was governor of Tennessee for eight years, and the first thing I did, it's like brushing your teeth, putting your pants on, you balance the budget. And we should do that here. We should separate the capital budget, and we should separate the operating budget, and we should, over a period of three or four or five years, do whatever it takes without raising taxes to bring the amount of money we take in close to the amount of money that goes out, and then we should get about creating a growth economy. So I don't think there's not only any contradiction at all between balancing the budget and raising the taxes any more than it is for a Boy Scout to tell the truth and earn a merit badge. What, <laughs> what kind of a flat tax would you favor? I mean, do you have a level and would you have any uh, deductions or exemptions? Can you specify? Thank you for that. I don't know the answer to that, to that yet. I've learned enough about tax reform in my public and private life to want to know what the consequences are before I jump. And a flat tax is the right direction, but a big jump. I like what Senator Dole and Speaker Gingrich have done in asking Jack Kemp to take a look at it. I've talked with Jack about it. I look forward to talking with him more about it. That's the direction in which I'd like to go. But I'm going to know what I'm talking about it before I commit to it. Questioner asks, what good is it to cut the capital gains tax, as you suggest, if the Federal Reserve Board then turns around, raises interest rates to boost the, to break economic growth, and you don't get uh, the uh, jobs and uh, job creation you want out of it? Well, it doesn't help to have high interest rates, but it does help to have low inflation, so the Federal Reserve Board has to do its job. Um, those two policies might operate against each other for a while, but I'm, President Kennedy proved, President Reagan proved, I know from my own personal experience. I sat around with a group of 10 small business people in Nashville at one of our Republican neighborhood meetings that was televised nationally, and I asked each of them, what is their single greatest problem in adding new jobs? And every single one of them said, getting more money. And they can't get it from banks, and they were spending every penny they had for themselves uh, in their business, and the only place they could go was to people who already had it. They understood perfectly what to do, and I guarantee you that would help. In farming today, it takes a million dollars of money to create one new farm job in Iowa. In a business like we're in, it might take fifty to hundred thousand dollars of money to create one new job. We need the jobs, we need the money, and we ought to blow down this wall that keeps us from getting it if we want to keep our standard of living. Are you in favor of A, a pro-life platform plank, and B, a pro-life vice presidential candidate? Well, I'll take the easy one first. Um, I would want to know what the view of a vice presidential candidate would be on a question as important as, as abortion. But that's not all I would want to know, nor would that view, one way or the other, disqualify or qual qualify that person. I would look for a vice president who, number one, I liked. You have to spend a lot of time together. And number two, uh, who was capable of being a good president, because so many have had to be, and who, number three, generally shared my views, generally shared them. I, I wouldn't reach so far in picking someone that it would play a trick on the voters by confusing them as to what we're for. Now, on question number one, I'm going to duck it. I'm going to duck it. I'm not going to start 
15 months before the convention trying to write the abortion plank of the Republican convention, or that's all we'll talk about between now and then, and we should be talking instead about growth, freedom, and personal responsibility. I'll be a part of it, be glad to tell you my position on abortion, uh, but I'm not going to start 15 months ahead of time trying to write the, a plank in the, in the platform. Senator Graham says he plans to filibuster the nomination of Dr. Foster to be Surgeon General. Senator Dole says he plans to block the nomination by legislative strategy. Your fellow Tennessean, what uh, should the Congress do in regard to Dr. Forster's nomination? Well, Senator Graham should be very good at filibustering. Senator Dole should be very good at stopping anything in the Senate. And they're capable of making those decisions. I, here's my position on Henry Foster. I know him well. I respect him. He's a good man. I think President Clinton made a terrible mistake when he nominated him. He's the wrong man for that position. I would never have nominated him for that position. I think in light of what Senator Dole has said, that what President Clinton should do is withdraw his nomination. As you're well aware, affirmative action has become a major issue, not only in California, but across the nation. What is your position on affirmative action? Thank you for the question. One of the, uh, one of the things that happens to someone like me, who's, who's been to Washington and knows enough about it, hopefully not to get skinned when he comes, but who's had most of his career outside Washington, is that I'm not here every day. And so positions that I've taken for a long period of time are positions that people here just don't know. And this is in one of those areas. There are a lot of people now who suddenly are talking about voting on the difference on what I would say what equal opportunity means. The difference between discrimination against someone and discrimination in favor of one. The difference with me is I've already taken actions on that. Let me give you an example. I believe we should be that the principle is equal opportunity. And that what we should do as a party and as a country is say no discrimination against. We live through that tragedy and not any discrimination for. What does that mean to me? That meant to me as a governor that I supported the Martin Luther King holiday, that I appointed the first black justice of the, of the, of the court, the Supreme Court in Tennessee, campaigned with him as a Republican, appointed all of the black vice presidents who've ever been appointed by the University of Tennessee and have fought hard for civil rights. It also meant that when I was the education secretary and was presented with the question, is it right or wrong to give college scholarships to students solely based on race, I said no. I caught a lot of heat for that, but I exactly believe that. I think it's wrong to discriminate against, and I've fought that, and I think it's wrong to discriminate in favor of somebody based on race, and I've said no to that as well. Why, sir, did you seek draft deferments during the Vietnam War? And do you, like President Clinton, feel vindicated by Robert McNamara's confessional book? The answer to the first question is I was a student. I, 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 I sought a, uh, the routine deferments that students seek for college and for law school and for one year as a law clerkship. Uh, all of which ended in the summer of 1966. Uh, at that time, uh, I reported to my draft board was classified 1A uh, and passed the physical examination and so was subject to being called. I was then older than most people who were called, but could have been called. Uh, I saw President Clinton's comment, which I thought was an odd comment for a commander-in-chief to, to make. Um, he should struggle with his own feelings about the Vietnam War. I'm comfortable with my decision. We should each make our own decision. I think he was wrong about it then, and he's wrong about it today, but that his focus should be on being a good commander-in-chief for the future rather than focusing on what happened then. Hillary Clinton has redefined 
the role of First Lady. What role would your wife, Honey, play as First Lady if you were elected President? The best person to ask that is my wife, Honey, <laughs> who is home today with our 15-year-old. Uh, she has no plans to be co-president. She supports my running for the presidency if I have a if I can clearly state why I'm running and what I hope to accomplish as president. In other words, if she believes I have a good, clear purpose for what I'm doing, then she thinks it's well worth my doing it. When I was governor, uh, she was deeply concerned about children and their future in our state. We had a terrible problem with prenatal health care, and she headed a healthy children initiative, which expanded prenatal health care into virtually every county in our state and actually helped lower uh, the, the infant mortality figures in, in Tennessee. My guess, knowing Honey, is that she would try to be as supportive as she could of what I'm doing um, and would find something in her area of interest to do uh, and would do it well. Uh, speaking of your wife, she is on the board of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and uh, I think both you and she were advocates of public television in Tennessee. Uh, what do you think of uh, the proposals in Congress to eliminate public television? Well, what I think about them is they create quite a bit of mail at our house. Uh, she, President Reagan appointed Honey to the uh, board of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and she's enjoyed serving there. Uh, my position on the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is that it, like every other government program we've got, has got to be on the block uh, for a reasonable reduction in its spending or its growth in spending until we get the budget under control. Speaking of budget control, what would you do to contain the runaway cost of Medicare and Medicaid? Well, Medicaid is easier. In 1981, I suggested, uh, I hadn't been governor very long before I could see the problem with Medicaid. The problem with Medicaid is that it has two masters, the federal government and the state government. And so congressmen come up here and get all excited about a new benefit and add it without knowing the full cost of it. And that's been going on for years and it's eating up the state, eating us alive. I could see that in 1981. And so Governor Busby of Georgia, a Democrat, and I suggested to President Reagan that we swap elementary and secondary education for Medicaid. It was almost an equal swap at that time, equal dollar swap, which would have meant that the federal government would take all of Medicaid and the states would take all of elementary and secondary education. The reason for that was first to get the feds out of noses out of the local schools, which would be good, but the other reason was to get Medicaid under control. Now the best thing the Senate could do, if it really wanted to end welfare and fix Medicaid, end welfare from Washington and fix Medicaid, would be to pick up Nancy Kassebaum's idea, which she's had sitting there for a year, which is the best idea, I believe, about both those, and swap Medicaid for welfare. Take $55 billion of Washington-based welfare programs, AFDC, food stamps, and the Women, Infants, and Children's Program, give that all back to the states, get Washington totally out of it, bring all of Medicaid here as step one, get it under control, and then block grant the entire Medicaid program back to the states. The end result would be all of the major welfare programs and all of the Medicaid spending decisions would be back with the states, and that would bring spending under control because, as we know, as we've heard in the school lunch debate, a 5% increase here is called a cut, and a 5% increase in spending in Tennessee and Michigan is called a, a nice increase. Now, that's what I do about Medicaid. About Medicare, uh, I haven't completed my thinking upon the proposals for Medicare except to know that I don't see any way to balance the budget in a reasonable period of time without including Medicare as one of the programs that, that we have to make a part of a balanced budget. And that means we have to work hard not to deny benefits as much as we can and I want to do that very carefully.
Thank you. Before we get to the last question, I have a couple of gifts for you. We don't have any flannel shirts here, but we do have a certificate uh, of appreciation for your taking the time to Thank be you with us. <laughs> we have a press club coffee mug, which you can uh, use either to uh, stay awake, uh, help you stay awake during your travels, or, or my to raise money, <laughs> raise money for your campaign. <laughs> And uh, the final question. May I give something back to you before the final? Sure, question? sure. Just in Tennessee, there's a nice. Uh, <laughs> so we have. Uh, this is a, uh, apparently, the, uh, the Washington news media has inspired me on this subject. So every day now, I'm going to be giving a nice red and black flannel shirt of the kind that I wore across the state in 1978 to some deserving person, and I'd suggest you keep it because the value of it might go up again. Thank you. Very Thank you very, very much. Sir. It's the first time I've gotten a gift. That's very nice. Uh, final question. Even though you pride yourself in being a Washington outsider, would you consider the vice presidential uh, nomination even with a Washington insider at the head of the ticket? I'm tempted to say the only way that job could be platable was if you didn't have to move to Washington. But the serious answer to that is anyone who knows me very well knows that I'm not interested in, in that. I'm not a good second fiddle. I'm in this for a purpose. Uh, I'd like to give a light answer to the question, but I really would like to um, help this country rebuild its confidence and the vice president can't help do that, but the president can. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Alexander, for being with us. And I thank all of you in the audience for being with us today. Good afternoon. Good question. This is a great, it's a great format to see people style and amaze people like me. It was a good question. Thank you very much. Oh, I like it. I mean, it's much, it's much, it's much better to have lively questions. Carl Byrne, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Christine Walton, Bloomberg Business News. Robert Novak, columnist, North American Syndicate. David Broder, columnist, The Washington Post. Mary Lou Forbes, commentary editor, The Washington Times. Charles Lewis, Washington bureau chief, Hearst Newspapers. Skipping over our guest speaker, Mark Johnson, media general news service and chairman of the National Press Club's Speakers Committee. John Fogarty, Kiplinger, California letter, and the member of the Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Thank you, John. Catherine Lewis of the Dallas Morning News, James Brosnan of the Memphis Commercial Appeal, Amy Breyer of Copley News Service, Steve Thoma, Knight Ritter Newspapers. <clears throat> Our guest today is a Washington outsider. <laughs> who wants to get inside the White House. In that, he follows in the tradition of most recent presidents. Bill Clinton, for example, was a White House, a Washington outsider who made it to the White House. Trouble is, when Washington outsiders are elected, they tend to become Washington insiders, leaving room for the next outsider to run. Lamar Alexander promises to be different. If elected, he says he'll dismantle so much of the Washington bureaucracy that no outsider will want to come here. <laughs> Mr. Alexander,
Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I'm president of the club and editor at large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome first our members in the audience and their guests, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, before introducing our head table, I would like to remind listeners of upcoming speakers. On Wednesday, April 19th, marine explorer Jean-Michel Cousteau will talk about the search for sustainability, which could be a political topic too, I suppose. On Thursday, April 20th, Carol Browner, uh, administrator of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, will speak on the subject of, quote, the earth is in your hands, responsibility and opportunity in the new generation of environmental protection. Quite a long title. And on Friday, April 21st, Fernando Henrique Cardoza, the president of Brazil, will talk about Brazil and the challenges of our times. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our speaker today, You'll find cards, <coughs> excuse me, at your table. Please write your questions on the cards, pass them up, and I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called from your right. Carol, who served as governor of Tennessee for eight years, has a list of $200 billion worth of federal programs he wants to send back to the states. For openers, he'd abolish the Department of Education, the very department that he headed under President George Bush. He'd also end the federal role in welfare, job training, law enforcement, and Medicaid. Governor Alexander already is displaying presidential qualities. He's a millionaire, for example and he presents himself as a man of the people. He announced for the presidency wearing khaki pants, a red and black flannel shirt, and boots. The same costume he wore when he walked across Tennessee to win the governorship in 1978. Mr. Alexander also knows how to retreat before the Republican takeover in, in, of Congress in November, Mr. Alexander supported term limits. Now that his party is in control, he says he'll be satisfied if members of Congress spend at least half a year at home to remember the principles that made America great. And Mr. Alexander also plays the piano. On the 14th floor of the press club, sir, we have the piano that Harry Truman played for Lauren Bacall when he was president. If you make it to the White House, you're invited to come up and serenade us. Born in 1940, Governor Alexander graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Van... Specifically than that, we're losing our confidence about our ability to affect that future. So what I'd like to do in a few minutes today is to talk with you about what we're losing, about what we need to do to recapture it, and a little bit about the choices that we have in the presidential elections of 1996. First on the choices. We're well enough now into a telecommunications age that we can actually tell it and feel it. It's turned our everyday lives upside down, and as a result of that, we're in the midst of a generational change in our leadership. Look at 1992. Here came Clinton. And right after that came national health care, national school board, taxes on achievement, Joycelyn Elders instead of Bill Bennett, 
reinvent America in Washington, D.C., and Americans took a look at that and said, holy smokes, how on earth did Bill Clinton ever end up with that agenda and as the role model at a time when what we're trying to do is teach our children the difference between right and wrong, and back we went as soon as we could go in 1994 with a Republican Congress and an agenda that was more like growth and freedom and personal responsibility. And so 1996 is a chance to decide which way in the midst of this generational change of leadership will we go. We have a chance to define our country for the future. We have a chance to decide whether 1994 is a bump or a turnaround uh, in our direction as a country. And we Republicans will be making an argument that we might do well to remember is an argument that no one can remember making or hearing in recent memory. We will be trying to persuade at least half the country that we ought to have Republican government, a Republican president, and a Republican Congress. He built university in 1962. He received his law degree from New York University in 1965. Since then, he's worked on Capitol Hill and in the White House, and he's headed the University of Tennessee. He and his wife, Honey, also started a business in 1987 that now employs 1,200 people. They have four children. Now, Governor Alexander yearns for a change in tempo as well as scene. He wants to trade in his rousing campaign song, Alexander's Ragtime Band, for the more sedate Hail to the Chief. He joins a crowded field of Republican contenders. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present the Washington outsider who wants in, Lamar Alexander of Tennessee. Thank you, Bud. Ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the 14th floor is where the piano usually is when I arrive to make a speech. People are now seen moving it out of the back door every time I, I come in. Last summer, I took a drive across our country. I spent the night with people that mostly I hadn't met before, and I found myself asking them this question, which I'd like to ask you t today. Looking ahead 20 years, do you think your children and your grandchildren will have more opportunity growing up in this country than you have had? Last summer, when I asked that question, I found most Americans were afraid to say yes. We're losing our confidence about our future, specifically about our future to pass off to our children and our grandchildren a better life than we have had. And maybe more specifically,